three, yep. two. Oh, okay. You can see me. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 231 of the security podcast. I meant 232, but that's okay. 232 of the security podcast here on in 30. Uh, again, last week we talked about backing up. We want to start this uh, cycle of of like 101 type things for people who are starting to listen to us. But we have some, not breaking news, some pretty bad exploits out there that are a little, I mean, they're a little like elevated for most people, but Tom's here, he's gonna explain it to us. And I think we can go from there. But so the first thing let's let's first talk about is today, today, today the 20th, today, I, today's not the 20th, is the last day for Windows 7 support. So this ties right into what we have to talk about. So if you're on Windows 7, uh, I mean, you can still uh, you can still upgrade. Edbot is there's a link. I'll link in the show note. Edbot is a tech journalist. He is he's checking every few days to see if the Windows 10 upgrade is still live. And as as of this recording on January 15th, it still is. So we'll link it down there. It, apparently it's not that hard. You make a USB key uh, backup, Windows Media Creator exec file, and you follow directions and you should be on Windows 10. And at this point, I think even Tom will say it's time to go. And we did talk about this. So yep. what say you, Tom? So Windows 10 is a security and privacy nightmare. Uh, not necessarily security nightmare, but privacy nightmare, absolutely. It'll shove ads down your throat. It's got weird stuff that'll show up in your start menu. They auto install some stupid applications. Some of them are just shortcuts to the Windows store, which is also being force fed to you. Yeah, it watches what you do and it feeds your ad and demographic data to Microsoft, but Here's the cool part. It gets security patches and Windows 10 or Windows 7 does not. So on the balancing act of which is worse, currently Windows 7 is going to be the worst evil. It's got, you know, security vulnerabilities. They are not going to be patched anymore. And Windows 10 is. So, yeah, it's a lesser of two evils and they both definitely are evil. If you want to go to Linux or go buy a Mac, cool. Um, and you can join our WhatsApp group and we can kind of walk you through those options. But if you want to stick with Windows, Windows 10 is the only rational choice. Look, I've played, look, I was not one of the beta testers for Windows 7. I was one of the download the free beta here and run it. And I loved Windows 7, like loved it, loved it, loved it. It was, it was amazing. So good. It was so good. And I don't have it with me, but I have the happy bag. So remember those cool funky backgrounds of all the comics? Yep. I have a reusable plastic bag in that shape that, that my brother-in-law got me from some Microsoft event. But Windows 7 was really, really good. And I am not a fan of Windows 10, but I've gotten used to it. You do have to sit there. You do have to strip away the Candy Crush saga and everything else. But it does work. You'll get used to it. It's not terrible but as you said it's phoning home it's constantly doing these things and maybe rightfully so because it forces auto updates but again it's your operating system so so you want to be you want to know how to use it and i yeah we don't like that it constantly phones home but we're in this cloud computing age where these things do so if you're really privacy focused os 10 if you want more linux is there and we, we did talk about this a couple shows ago so yeah. So you can go listen to that. Um, so the big, let's start with the Windows 10 bug because I can at least probably still talk about it. Uh, so yesterday they found, not yesterday, but they found a Windows 10 exploit. It's really bad. Tom will explain it, but basically it goes all the way down the line. So even though we just said Windows 7 may not receive, will not receive any more updates, I have a feeling Windows 7 will be getting this update, especially if it involves Edge and, uh, I don't know if we call it Internet Explorer anymore, but I have a feeling they will out of cycle it, to fix it, and to move on. Yeah, this is a, um, as far as bad vulnerabilities go, this one's pretty nasty. It's not remote code execution, but you could get caught in this one pretty easily. And it's actually fairly trivial to exploit. Uh, basically, the, the TLDR, I'm going to bury the lead right here, um, is... It's a cryptography bug that allows an attacker to create a certificate um, using elliptic curve cryptography that appears to be 100% genuine and valid. Meaning uh, 
if you wanted to create a, a site that Rick rolls people and have it show up as, um, let's just pick a random website. Let's pick uh, NSA.gov. Uh, you could mint an NSA.gov certificate and it would be 100% valid according to Windows. Um, this is a nasty, nasty vulnerability. Um, it is fixed. It is patched. It's out there. Uh, so if you haven't done your updates, go do that now. Like, like pause the show, go do it now sort of thing. Uh, if you're on Windows 10, you've probably already been auto upgraded, which is great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's bad. Uh, and it's pretty trivial to exploit. Now, is this going to like take over your machine immediately? Is it going to worm its way through the internet? No, probably not. But could it allow some funny screenshots shown on the uh, Ars Technica article of, um, you know, a Rickroll video uh, with NSA.gov with a totally secure padlock over here in Chrome? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely doing that. And while you're doing that, and we'll come back to this in a second, uh, please, if you're using Firefox, I didn't tell Tom ahead of time, but Firefox also has a nasty, this is now a remote code execution uh, update. Update. So you're updating Windows, or not Windows, you're updating, uh, yeah, you're updating Windows. Update Firefox as well, because there's a nasty bug there too that they're trying to push out. So just update all the things. And again, this is why auto update is so important. And yep. at this point, it's, it's I know like to control when their updates go and everything else but it's really really important to stay on top of the updates or just set it to auto update and set like just restart my computer at 2 a.m every day and just do whatever you need to do to keep updated yeah and it, trust me I, I used to be in that camp of watching all the updates go through but i i have enough systems and virtual machines running around now like every operating system supports an auto update mechanism of some kind just just turn it on. I, I don't want to tell you to, to give up control over your life, but frankly, it's the lazy option, right? I don't have time to manage all these systems. I don't want to write automation wrappers around it and manage everything through Ansible, right? I, I played that game. I did it. So I, I just, I want the time back in my life. Let the things auto update. They'll take care of themselves. Just don't worry about it, man. Go with the flow. Flow with the updates. Look, it's it's one of those things that, look, I know when they say, oh, you're in the middle of a paper. Oh, you have to update now. And yeah, you can put you can push it a little bit, but don't just push it off too much. My my corporation has uh, you can only postpone this three times or something like that, or you will be updated in seven days, whether you like it or not, which I kind of like. And then uh, my sons, my two sons, Android tablets, their Samsungs say you can only postpone this notification three times before we force an update on you. So I kind of like that. Like, hey, we'll leave you alone, but we're going to get more persistently annoying at, as the time comes. So, yeah, uh, yeah uh, maybe after the show, you're listening you say, you know what? Over my lunch break, I'm just going to hit update. Just go out, let it do its thing. And, and hopefully and hopefully uh, everything gets updated when you come back. Yeah, it's, I mean, these updates, and you're, you're all computer users, you know how this works, you don't have to babysit it or, or click next 100 times or anything. It's basically an automatic process at this point. Just go take a long lunch or a short lunch for, for some of these updates, like this Windows 10 update. It's a really tiny thing. It's a really tiny, really important thing, but it's not going to take forever to update. And just kick it off and go grab a burger or something. So... Hey, there are two updates right off the bat. Um, so I don't have anything much else to add to these two things, but it sounds like, okay, we're going to update. We're going to do all this. Uh, yeah, it's it's. we talked last week about backing up. If you got your backup all set, just remember that you took an image of a bad Windows thing that you're going to have to update anyway. But you have that. Now you can update because the next thing that we can necessarily talk about is the problem is the reason you don't update is because people always feel like they update and something goes wrong. Something breaks. I mean, we could talk about a Catalina. OS 10 Catalina broke a whole bunch of 32-bit apps that make even Audacity. Tom had to give me the, the, the terminal line to make it work. So you, so you hear this and you say, maybe I shouldn't update. Or when uh, iOS went to the skeuomorphic design, I'm not updating. But it's real. I mean, you, you're going to have to at some point. So just bite the bullet, update, and then figure out your workflow from there. Yeah, it's... 
I agree. It's painful. It's annoying, especially with big OS updates like Catalina, right? Uh, like a big OS update, especially if you're if you're on Windows 7 today and you're jumping to 10, stuff might get weird. It's going to be different. You're going to have to find a totally new way of operating, right? Control panel is now split into two control panels for whatever reason. This is so ridiculous. Why is this world like this? But frankly, the sooner you get it over with, the sooner it's going to be over with. Um, I, I will be the first to admit, I don't like Windows 10. I loved Windows 7, but at some point you just have to go with it or understand that you're going to use a completely unsupported, insecure, really dangerous operating system. I mean, it's one of those, yes, before you go live or Friday at 4.59 before you push something into production, don't, That now that's not the time to necessarily update. But no. Friday, 4.59 on Friday is never the right time. Or when you're recording a, a podcast, maybe a security show, maybe yeah. maybe hitting the upgrade button at that moment in time isn't the wisest. So uh, so don't do that. Not that I've ever had experience with something like that that completely broke my system for a little bit. We totally haven't pushed off a show or two because I got happy about updates. <laughs> well, the issue is you wake up, so you go to... This is what happens. So there is an Android, the July, the July, the January security patch for Android hit for me today and it disappeared. So that, that bugs me a little bit. So now it's, yeah, sure. Update me. And then I'm thinking, uh oh, when does the alarm go off? Because right. You want to do the updates on your phone and you have an alarm, but Android makes it that if you restart your phone, you have to put your pin in. And the question is, does the alarm still work if your pin is not put in? It shouldn't, by all definitions, it shouldn't. That, that's some sort of leaking of information. So for me, I, I always get nervous and I want to do it. Now I got to stay up and how long is it going to take? And it's just a security update. So it should probably take a couple of minutes. But again, we get it. We see this and it's annoying. And to tell the normal person, you have to do this. Uh, I wish updates... Updates have gotten a lot better, a lot more bulletproof, a lot more. You don't have to worry on the other end that you can do it while driving. Don't do it while driving, but you can hit the update and be okay later. But again, they're still a little scary for us guys, for us, I don't say guys, for us who've been around a while and have seen updates fail and you're rolling back and everything else. Yeah, even so. even Windows updates, which have had like a really like that's what kind of put the the update fear into people because do you remember windows xp when you would get those like big service pack patches and then it it reboots and tries to install and you're not sure when it's coming back i get an hour passes and you've still got the little little things spinning you're like well I mean, I, I don't want to turn it off because if I turn it off and it's doing something, I'm going to break something, right? Then yeah. it's like half installed and, and you'll never get that back. So, you know, is it, is it done? Is it not? But it, frankly, updates have gotten so much better. They're not perfect. They're nowhere near perfect. And the Catalina update is kind of the poster child, unfortunately, of this. But for the most part... Update problems are the exception rather than the rule. These things are tested. They're pushed out to small subsets of people um, with, you know, telemetry enabled. Like they're beta testers who are testing this stuff out. iOS updates are a perfect example. Apple pushes out iOS, you know, OS updates as betas. And they say, hey, if you want to try the latest and greatest iOS software, sign up for this beta list. Uh, by the way, we're going to collect a little bit of telemetry to see if this thing actually bricks your phone. And if it does, we're sorry, but you're beta testers. So it's okay. You signed up for this. That's great. Um, Microsoft with Windows updates, they're doing that with Windows 10. Um, right. They have the insiders program. You can sign up to test out, you know, new major and even pre-release Windows updates. And if something goes wrong there, the insiders are going to have kind of a bad day. But you and the general populace, it's usually going to get caught before it gets to you. So. Again, we're going to update it. I want to move on to, and I'm not going to be able to explain this, Citrix. Uh, I don't use Citrix, but apparently a lot of people do. And they're up. They they have some really nasty, again, another vulnerability. And people are going crazy on how to mitigate it and solve it. But we don't know. I don't know much of anything. I'm going to let Tom handle this. Yeah, so if, if you run a Citrix application delivery controller, or the ADC, um, also used to be known as the Netscaler ADC, um, and Citrix Gateway, or used to be called Netscaler Gateway, um, there's a pretty nasty remote vulnerability 
uh, exploit that's happening here, and it can be exploited. Um, code is up on GitHub right now to show how the exploit works. It's kind of hit the net all over the place, and yeah, it's t- being turned into a bot, and it's it's all kinds of bad. There are mitigations out there. Um, so if you're running one of these things, if you're running uh, the Citrix ADC um, and Citrix Gateway, then you might want to either, if they're not important, you know, maybe shut them down. Um, but uh, if they are important, if you need to keep them up, there are mitigations in place. You absolutely need to do that or you are going to get owned. That's it. Really end of story. Uh, Citrix has known about this for just about a month. Um, on December 17th, they released a security advisory, um, and Citrix does have published mitigations um, in the form of config adjustments. So just reconfigure the device, and you'll kind of get bypassed. Um, but Citrix has not released a patch yet. So yeah, uh, not great. Um, if you're running one of these devices, and it's definitely more focused towards the enterprise people who listen to our show, but uh, yeah, be careful. Again, it's these, I, I don't want to call it the corporate companies, but I just feel like it's, I, I guess, I guess the problem with remote desktop and all these other things, they're hooking into too much. And when something happens, they have to fix it without breaking other functionality. It just, but it, it just, as a person looking in, it's like, why can't we stop these already? But I understand how all this works. So as long as they get a timely patch and disclose it, I, I guess I'm okay with it. So, Yeah, I, I think unfortunately timely has passed it being almost a month with a remote code execution vulnerability um yeah and it it, you're right it's it's could be a hard problem right it might be a really nasty thing that if they fix this they're gonna break something else and then and then the house of cards falls apart right because software isn't just a thing right it's it's quite literally Tables stacked on tables, stacked on tables, stacked on tables, held together with twine and used bubble gum most of the time, right? Software is complicated and has a lot of direct and indirect dependencies. And when you fix one thing, it could cause a weird chain reaction that breaks something else totally different. And then you've got to fix that thing. And it's it's a whole mess. Software development uh, is a lot of fun and horribly, horribly frustrating all at the same time. Just do it right the first time. That's all I have to say. But again, I'm standing in my ivory tower telling others to do it. So it's so easy. All you have to do is write code without bugs. Like, come on. I mean, how hard is that? (laughs) It can't be that hard. Just so everyone's aware, I'm I'm a software developer. And yes, I realize the insanity of that statement. I don't know. Just play a perfect game of football. What's so hard about throwing perfect passes 100% of the time? I mean, it's just it, they're it's just mathematical formulas, right? Just don't yeah. screw up on your angle and your release. <laughs> anyway, let's let's leave off on something else that is totally, totally. Uh, you can you can stop this, but no one wants to. Uh, five Princeton, I guess, graduate students, researchers, is figured out uh, they. They wrote a paper on SIM swapping attacks. That's when you call your company and you uh, say, hey, I lost my phone. Can I get a new SIM card? But instead of your phone, you're doing it on Jack Dorsey's phone or Donald Trump's telephone or some famous celebrity or somebody with a three-letter Twitter handle that you're trying to steal. So basically, you're saying you're lying to be there. And the reason you do this is to get either the reset tokens or the two-factor codes or whatever it is. So a group of five Princeton researchers uh, went in. They bought a whole bunch of uh, prepaid. They did a lot with prepaid. They they did some with postpaid. And basically, the big five... So AT&T, T-Mobile, TrackPhone, US Mobile, Verizon, and I guess Sprint's in there some, somewhere. They're all really, really, really bad. Like not even a little good, just like straight up really bad. And the, basically in almost every case, in every case they were allowed to basically SIM swap many times just over the phone, many times without even providing real information by just by saying, hey, uh, I don't know it, can you help me? Yeah, it's it's standard phishing, right? Uh, people generally, especially in customer service uh, positions, people generally want to be helpful. They want to help out their their fellow person. And um, you know, one of the one of the greatest uh, phishing phone calls I saw was a person looped a 
a sound clip of a wailing, crying baby in the background uh, and had a woman say, look, I'm sorry, it's my newborn. He won't stop crying. I'm, I'm just trying to do this one thing. I'm, I'm trying to just get this one thing fixed on my account. If you could just help me out, that'd be great. Cause I, I need to feed him a bottle and give him a nap. Like I, my whole world is crumpling. Can you please just help me? And the person on the other end just wants to be a good person. They want to get this person out of a bind. So they take some shortcuts. They do some things they're not really supposed to do because they're just trying to help. And unfortunately, that's what the attackers want. The attackers want you to buy into the crying baby. And not to say that everyone who calls into customer service is a liar. That's not the case at all. Uh, but, you know, your kindness can and will be taken advantage of by attackers. So I have better detailed information. So I'll give you an example. Uh, they first tried with last payment. So if you don't know something, they say, okay, what's your last payment? This sounds reasonably okay, because if you're paying the bill, you should know this. But it's not that hard to uh, to buy a refill on something and then say, oh, my last payment was exactly what you bought. All right. So you could purchase a refill card at a retail store, submit, submit a refill on their victim's account because you know their phone number, and then do the SIM swap. So you buy it and then you know it. Now, this is on prepaid. I mean, I don't know how prevalent I'm, – I'm an elitist over here. We don't do prepaid over here, but I, I guess a, a, many of the people do, so that's something that you can do. I was on prepaid for a very long time. I mean, I if T-Mobile wasn't just so good and so cheap, I probably would do prepaid at this point or Google Fi or any one of the pay-as-you-go type things because all they're doing is just buying the same spectrum off the big guys and just repackaging it. It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, recent numbers, if you know the person's phone number you're trying to hack, uh, just call them. Like literally, just call them and hope that they call you back. It's not that hard. Call for one second. Uh, try to call from, if you call, do what the robocalls are doing. They're calling from somebody with your same three-digit extension. And maybe it's important. So... Or, or send them a message and say, we're, we're trying to verify some information in your account to keep your debit card active and your bill pay working. Please call this number. Guess what? They just called that number. You don't even have to do anything like with financial information. Just get them to call the number. Personal we're information. Not, we're not advocating these attacks. We're giving examples just to throw the disclaimer out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a few more personal information that you can get based on data aggregation websites. So, okay. Account information, activation dates, or some other stuff, or last four, the credit card numbers. Again, it's this is getting a little harder, but still, you can do this. And device information. I don't know how you get device information, but... If you are able to uh, get malware onto the person's phone... Um you could grab some device information. Uh, I know a lot of applications really like to try to grab IEM, uh, sorry, uh, IMEI and other um, like baked in device identifiers. I think that's kind of curtailed with modern OSs, but um, yeah, for older ones, it's going to be a problem. And they also say, if you just talk loudly and in a maddening voice, people are willing to help you. So it's the social yep. engineering aspect of this. And, and so... Look, I don't know what the remedies are for this. We talked about what they're trying to do. They're trying to get TOTP code. They're trying to get the SMS, the SMS codes to wipe out your bank account or whatever it is. So the faster you can move away from SMS codes and go to TOTP or a YubiKey or some sort of FIDO, align, a FIDO key, the better it is. Again, and we, we've said this statistic, both Microsoft and I think Google both have verified this. If you have any sort of second factor, so even SMS, 97 or 99%, it's a 97 or 99% effective rate. You are pretty, you are, unless you're being targeted, you are pretty good. So there, I wouldn't um, worry about this. Yeah. There is an attack that I've actually seen uh, going around the esports community, amazingly enough. Um, where somebody pops up a phishing site that looks like an esports tournament they're like oh yeah look it's a pretty cool tournament 500 hundred dollar prize pool i'd like to play with you um and it pops up with like a steam or other gaming application login and one of the fields in there is for your steam guard or your your second factor code so when you plug all that in they've got a bot on the other side that just submits it logs in and takes over your account 
Um, so if you're using a second factor that allows that requires you to type in some numbers like TOTP, Google Authenticator, Authy, all those guys. Um, be careful where you're typing stuff in. Make sure you're actually where you're supposed to be. Now, if you've got a YubiKey, uh, if you're using U2F, um, it's not actually vulnerable to that kind of attack. So I have a weird question. Can you put, can you wait till one second left in the TOTP code and then submit? And then... No. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> most, most of the time, uh, on these on the backend systems on the servers, um, there's a little bit of flex time, uh, or or really a flex amount, um, and it's by default in many of the TOTP applications configured for one. So one code either before or after, because it's got that skew, right? Because they know people's phones and clocks, like they're not going to be perfect. Time isn't synchronized that well. Like it's, it's synchronized really well from a human perspective, but there's going to be some drift somewhere in there. And let's say somebody has got something based on time that hasn't synchronized in a while. If they're, you know, 15 seconds off, all right, just let them in. Uh, so yeah, if you wait till one second, probably not going to do yourself any favors. So I should wait till zero seconds and then submit even more. Wait till <laughs> you should memorize the code, wait 25 seconds and then submit. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's the, it's, it's, I swear that I went to T-Mobile and I said, exactly. I said, look, uh, please, please ask for some, I know on T-Mobile you can put a passphrase. I don't know if that helps, but because sometimes they ask me, sometimes they don't. But I really think that you should be able to call the customer service people and have a note that says, uh, I'm an important person. Uh, this is the only way you can get in and go from there. Like there should be that added layer. I don't think it's that hard yeah. for this customer service person to pull up your notes because they have your account number, make an extra field of high security because we do that with other people. We do it with other things. This is a high security account or high security whatever and say, uh, do not allow person must come into the store or must do something that they can do. They must call, they must do this and, and go from there. But I guess, like yeah. you said, they want to be helpful and everyone, the, the mobile carriers are already down. So they just want to, they just want to be helpful. And I guess people still buy phones at the carriers. People still walk into Verizon or AT&T or Apple or whatever it is. So the chance of somebody buying a random phone and saying to swap it is probably very low. So they're just using all these human psychology tactics on everybody and going from there. Yeah, they, I would love to see something built in to the customer service portal, right? So by default, most of the time, I'm going to say, uh, customer service has got a whole lot of power. And if there's a note in your account, they might read it and they might not, which is really, really fallible. But what if you were to have the person check a box that completely locks out all administrative functions from the customer service representative until they type in the password you give them over the phone, right? So they can't do anything until you they have a, a password that would be great now i don't know of any company who does this but i'd sure like to see it it can't be that hard but again we're talking about this 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 almost never happens i mean this is a statistical rounding error yeah. but if your name is jack dorsey it happened to you if your name is a fa insert famous celebrity you're being attacked like this and everything else but if you're just if you're one of us we're not celebrities we're not that important Look, we keep our guard up and, and everything else, but it's, look, any sort of two-factor is better than no two-factor. Yeah. So at this point, I don't have much, I mean, I don't have much anything else. All I can say is join our WhatsApp group. Uh, we talk there, we have fun, and I, I really think we'll just see everyone next week. Yeah, we'll see you then. So have fun, everyone. Good night. See ya. 2911. That's good. I've got Audacity stopped.